I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You, you know, Billy, when we, you know, we're, we might be driving along and we see fire in the woods and we think, oh my goodness, that is so bad, you know, but fire actually can be used as a management tool if done correctly. It really can. And the, the key, and you said it, done correctly, right? And, you know, getting started is an important part when you're doing these prescribed fire. And one of the things, making sure it doesn't get out of control, right? So we've got Cody Roden on from the um, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. He's going to be talking about kind of getting those control lines set, um, a, an important part of prescribed fire. So looking forward to having Cody on here shortly. We also have Grace Coy with the Urban Forest Initiative here out of UK. And she's going to be talking about kind of the these tree protection ordinances that are out there. It's a really informative talk and really important. Um, trees play such an important role across Kentucky, but especially in our urban areas where there may not be as many of them, they're even more important. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing from Grace. And then both you and I have a couple of quick timely announcements that we'll share with the audience. So make sure you stick around for those, but delighted to have you all with us. Uh, you can use the chat function in Zoom to uh, interact with us, ask questions of our guests. And if you're on YouTube, we're glad to have you either live or in the recording. So thank you so much. Definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. Cody, if you'd like to turn on your camera. Hey, welcome to the show. We appreciate you being on. Hello. Yes. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to spread the good word about fire. And you all are 100% are right um, in your little discussion there in the beginning. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to, to talk to you all about fire today. Okay. Glad to have you, Cody. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to be with us. No problem. All right, so can you all see my slides? Yes. Good deal. So again, my name is Cody Roden. Professionally, I'm the small game program coordinator at Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, and small game in Kentucky are quail, rabbits, um, and squirrels. I'm also the training chair for the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council, which hopefully I'll have a little bit of time at the end to talk a little bit about what the fire council is, but essentially it's... Um, a conglomerate of the fire practitioners in the state. So people from Kentucky Division of Forestry, um, federal partners, TNC, um, as well as the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. So in this talk today, um, I think, you know, before we talk about control lines and how to make sure we're keeping our controlled burn in the box, I want to talk a little bit about the why we should use prescribed fire. And then again, we'll dig into that how as far as um, generating our control lines. And so essentially we know as, as forest stewards that, you know, the essentially what we're shooting for on our private lands or in our forestry resources in the state is the health of our system, right? The health of our forested system. And we know that healthy forests require disturbance. Um, so this disturbance stimulates a seed bank and um, it can increase diversity in our forest stands. And we know that, you know, the, the key to any healthy system, whether it's, um, our forest resources in the state, our open land systems, um, our wetland systems, you know, diversity is the key. Uh, plant diversity, which leads to insect diversity, which leads to animal diversity, um, is key to the health of those systems. And so as a quick example, um, so this image, this is one picture. I put the black bar um, right down the middle of it. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see the, the text there. There was no fire um, put in that forested system. On the right side, there was a little bit of management and um, fire put through that system. You know, and so I, I posed the question, you know, which one looks healthier? And so maybe to the untrained eye, they look pretty similar, right? But if we look really hard on the left side, we can see kind of in the background, it looks more dark and shaded. There's not as much um, herbage or, or grasses and forbs on the ground on the forest floor, right? But on the right side, you know, we can see this nice bright sunlight reaching all the way down to the forest floor, which is encouraging this vegetative growth um, in the form of broadleaf plants which again is gonna encourage more insects to be in there, which is gonna encourage more ground nesting birds and other wildlife to be in there. And in my mind, you know, just thinking about the health of our forest system, this one on the right definitely looks healthier to me. Um, and again, if you can, if you look just at that black bar, just to the right of that, that's actually a fire break that was used to um, control that forested burn um, from getting from not getting into the area on the left where it says no fire versus the area on the right where we did use fire to manage that stand. 
And so what's one way we can achieve this disturbance, right? We need disturbance. And again, this can come in many forms, whether it's mechanical, where we're going in and felling trees, like you can see in this picture, some of those trees have been cut down. Um, whether it's a, a natural disaster, um, these systems need disturbance to uh, be healthy and perpetuate into the future. And today, and a lot of times I talk about fire, right? Fire is the oldest tool in the human toolbox, not only for land management, but if we think back to even like early hominoid species that controlled fire in the form of a campfire, and you know, they cooked meat on that campfire and pre-digested those proteins and then consumed that meat and we were able to you know, get bigger brains and stuff like that. And if we think about just human evolution, fire, you know, could predate things like language and things like that. And so fast forward a little bit, humans have been burning a lot in Kentucky for the past 3000 years um, in the form of Native Americans, right? And so Native Americans burned the East quite a lot. And so here in this image, if you look on the right, this was from uh, peer reviewed research that was looking at um, historic um, signs of fire in the landscape, things like fire scars on really old stumps. Um, we know from pollen records um, and other things like that, that the native people were using fire so much that it actually changed our eastern forest system 3,000 years ago. So they, they've been burning, they were burning for up, for up to about 250 years ago, and this they burnt for so long it actually changed the system to be more fire adapted. Um, and so one point I like to make with this image, you know, all of the east is considered open forest, right? And so what, what might that look like? That essentially doesn't really look like what East Kentucky looks like today. It looks kind of like you have a tree, you're walking into a tree and then 30 yards away there's another tree and underneath all of these trees is grass and herbs and stuff like that. Um, it was more of an open forested system. The closed forest we see now in East Kentucky was really isolated to the northeast or the higher northern um, latitudes. And again, this fire and openness created diversity, which created a healthy system. Okay, so now I've sold you on the need hopefully for fire or the, the benefits of fire to your system. Now, really quickly, there's two big things we need to start with um, if we're looking at using fire. So KDF is a statutory authority in the state of Kentucky. Um, the Kentucky Division of Forestry is uh, for fire. So they're the wildland responding unit. So if you did see that fire driving down the road and it was a wildfire, it would be the Kentucky Division of Forestry that would respond to it. So they've generated a few important laws in Kentucky to try to to try to limit um, the detrimental aspects of wildland fire. And so there's a fire hazard season in Kentucky that runs from February 15th to April 30th. So we're in that fire hazard season right now. And there's a second one that runs from October 1st to December 15th. And so we can only burn our forests in a prescribed way at those times between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So we can still burn in these windows, but we can only burn in the evening hours. And that's largely because the relative humidity is higher. Um, the forest just isn't, generally speaking, isn't in a isn't environmentally or weather-wise in a way where the fire could could get out of the box as easy. And there's a second really important um, law. Essentially, these are the only two laws. Um, specific to prescribed fire in the state. And so the second one is it must have some sort of fire break around it. And so let's talk about how to do that. So if you have your um, plot of land, so here on the right, I just have an image um, from a recent burn we did in Barron County. And so this is an open lands burn, but very similar um, things would apply to your forest land burns. And so first of all, identify your unit. You know, if you have 40 acres of timber on your property, you know, generally speaking in the state of Kentucky, we want to get fire in those woods once every five years. So a good thing might be to do is to, to break it up into thirds or maybe even smaller than that and, and burn one section each year every few years. And so for this, our objective in this open land was to just try to decrease the woody stems that are in this open area. So this area has uh, native warm season grass, native forbs. And so we're just trying to run fire through there to get rid of those woody stems. And so identifying your unit, we wanna think of how we can use natural breaks um, for some of these unit delineations. And so a natural break would be something like um, a stream, um, a wet draw, uh, a really a pond or something like that, something where fire is not going to, to it's going to naturally stop there, right? We can also think of things like roads. So on this image, the, so it's oriented north-south, the images, 
we can see on the eastern side, um, we have a mowed lawn. So that's actually a mowed area right next to the a WMA office. So we're going to use that as our fire break. That's easy. On the south side, we have a hard top road, a two lane road. That's going to be one of our fire breaks. That's really easy. And then on the western side is a gravel two track road. We're going to use that too. So three of our four fire breaks are already made for us. And that's kind of what this talk is about. You know, looking from a planning perspective at your property and trying to figure out, you know, what's the least amount of effort we can use to 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 break up the fuel in a way that um, makes it so the fire is not going to not going to get out of the box. And so that yellow polygon was our burn unit. Um, and so we actually successfully burnt that one off uh, earlier this year. OK, so talking a little bit more specifically about fire in your forest. And so essentially, you know, when we go to build our fire breaks, we have a really important rule of thumb. And that rule of thumb is, you know, our breaks should be about three or at very least three times as wide as the tallest vegetation that will burn. And so essentially what that means is, you know, looking at our unit and from a planning perspective, we always want to plan fire. You know, we would never want to plan fire for a point in time when the trees might light on fire, right? So we want to pick environmental conditions and variables that would only essentially burn off the leaf litter, and maybe some of our smaller saplings. So a mature tree, we don't want to be burning in a condition where mature trees might be at risk of, of being on fire. And I've only seen that personally once in the state of Kentucky, and that was in 2016. If you remember when we had really bad wildfires in the eastern part of the state, um, eastern Tennessee had the same thing in 2016. I did see mature trees becoming online as, as available fuel. But again, that was like a biblical drought. And, you know, what I'm talking about here is prescribed fire. So we're planning this. We can pick our day. We can pick the, the weather variables that make it so those mature trees are offline. We're not going to hurt those mature trees. So essentially, you know, if we think about a, a native warm season grass planting, you know, that grass is going to be like roughly maybe five or six feet tall. And so our fire break needs to be at least, at very least, 20 feet wide. And again, that's... Um, we're trying to make the break in, in the fuel that we want so the fire is not going to get across it. And in the forest, since we're going to be burning leaf litter and we're considering that as our available fuel, you know, six to eight inches deep, maybe if it's never been burned before and it's in a high quality oak hickory stand, we're going to make that break at very minimum three feet. And so in this image here, this was actually in the northeast part of the state. Um, you can see the person igniting the leaf litter there and you see the black bars to the left of the igniter showing kind of the delineation of the fire break. And so um, if that guy that's lighting the fire, he's probably about six foot tall. So if he laid down right there to take a nap or something, right, we can see that that fire break is, is about six feet wide. And so that's more than enough to, to not allow the fire that he's lighting to go across that and light the leaf litter on the other side. Because again, um, when we do prescribe fire and we make breaks, we're assuming that what we're wanting to light and the adjacent fuels to the left of that lighter is in a similar condition. So if you were to step over and light that stuff, it would light up as well, right? So it's still available. We need to break that fuel, the, con the continuancy of that fuel to make it so we're keeping it in the box. And so how do we do that? So one, one or two ways we can do it in the forest. Number one, the easiest is a leaf blower. So some of these higher CC backpack leaf blowers um, are really good at this. Um, I've used these a couple of times where, you know, the bigger ones will blow rocks up out of the dirt, right? And so essentially we're in the forest, we're trying to get down to bare mineral soil. And so essentially what that means is, you know, we got all the leaf litter off and there's like maybe some roots and stuff or some, some rotting wood or something in there. We want to get that stuff out as well. We want like bare dirt for three to six feet in our forested systems. And that will be sufficient. And in most cases, if we plan properly, that will be sufficient to, to break the fire and not allow it to, to go over. So the leaf blower, that's the easiest way. Another way um, on these two images to the right is what's called a council rake. And essentially this is like a gravel rake on steroids. It kind of looks like um, the teeth of a combine, um, if you can imagine what that looks like at the end of a rake. And essentially these things are really good at, at moving, um, not only moving leaf litter, but also digging down into the soil. And you can see on that far right-hand side, um, that individual is, is working on some, some bare mineral soil. They're using that rake to pull off the duff um, and the rotting um, 
roots and stuff like that that might be down in there. Okay, so we've ignited our unit and we're hoping that the fire looks like this, right? And this is what 99% of our prescribed fire in the forest in Kentucky should look like. You know, very low level, low intensity fire, just creeping along. You got high residency time. So the fire is staying in one place for a long time, burning down through the leaf litter. And you're spending a lot of really good times when you fire intolerant saplings or trees and maybe hurting them a little bit. Remember, we want those out of the system um, and we want our quality fire tolerant trees and plants to, to persist. And so this fire is just creeping along. Essentially what we want is to build a fire break that this creeps along and then it stops. As you can see, these two individuals are standing in the fire break. If you look what they're standing on, that's bare ground to the left of what they're standing on. That was the unit that we were burning that day and that's black and smoking and stuff. But you can see the fire just crept right up to that break and then it went out. Um, those individuals right there, one of them has a rake. The other one has a bladder pack with some water in it. So they're standing there cooling off some of the veg, some of the, the litter, the leaf litter right next to the fire break to make sure that that break is secure. And so I mentioned, you know, kind of the, the easiest way to get this done is with that leaf blower and then the rake. Obviously, that's going to take a little bit more um, labor. And here, here's the easiest way, and that's to use roads. And so here we have two images of using two track roads. So these are just like would be your farm roads or something like that. And again, these are in the open lands, but uh, very similar to our, our forested systems. And so on the left here, you can see we have a two track road. This individual um, is pointing into the unit that we want to burn. And so this actually, to, to make this an even better break, what you could do is mow on the inside of your unit, make one pass with the bush hog, um, especially in your, your open land units. Um, and that'll just help reduce the fire intensity next to your break. And then on the right hand side here, uh, we can see a two track and we didn't mow anything next to the break, but that fire went up to the two track, went out. Um, you can see those those um, those people, those uh, those holding resources, those individuals in the blue and the green um, outfits there. They're kind of just standing there making sure um, nothing's creeping across that line. But for the most part, it burned up to that um, and stopped. And if you notice the individual on the four wheeler, he's kind of got his head down. Um, that little bit of fire right there is actually really hot. Even he's, he's pretty far away from it. It doesn't look like a lot, but he's, he's probably cooking right there. And so mowing the inside of that fire break where that black is right there, if you were just to go in and mow that, that would really reduce the um, intensity of the flames right next to your fire break. And it would help with your holding resources as far as um, allowing them to, to be comfortable and not get, not get roasted. Okay, and so a big caveat with the two track road as our fire break. And so we're looking at this image here, we can see on the left is black. So that's the unit, that's what we wanted to burn. And on the right is a whole bunch of stuff we didn't want to burn. And right there in the middle, that's our two track road. So if we have a two track road that we're using um, for our fire breaks, we wanna make sure that we're prepping it. If we wanna make sure that there's no fuel in that two track road. So if you look closely, around this red circle, you can see that's black. So the reason that's black is because the fire kind of jumped over into the middle of the two track road. There was standing vegetation between the two tire tracks. And so that actually lit up and then that fire could easily have jumped um, to the right and, and lit the other side on fire as well. And so if you're gonna use a two track, two track road, just make sure you're bush hogging um, that middle right in between the tire tracks or making sure there's no fuel available um, in the break. That's really important. Next, we have gravel roads. So these, I mean, these take very little prep um, from a, you know, getting in there and bush hogging any of the, the in between the tire tracks. Usually they're wider, more compacted, um, and these are really good to use uh, for fire breaks. One thing I will say in forested units, so obviously you can see this is kind of a, it goes in and out of a forested unit, but sometimes what can happen is after leaf fall, this can actually form a continuous um, layer of fuel across the road. So you might need to go in there and blow it out um, right before you burn or something like that. Just keep them, just, you're trying to get all the fuel out of the break essentially. And one last really good example of a, a fire break. This one probably takes the most effort but it's definitely the, the best bang for your buck. So this image was actually taken, I think in January, um, but that individual, that, that sportsman that's walking right there, um, he's walking on winter wheat. So they actually uh, prepped 
and keep these lines as permanent fire breaks in this particular area. And again, this goes through the forest and it goes through open lands. Um, these lines are snaking all around throughout the property. And this individual has planted all of these line of winter wheat. So when we go to burn these areas in the spring, which is usually when we want to burn the open lands in the state of Kentucky, um, this whole fire break is green. Green vegetation, again, if we're planting properly, does not burn, right? So there's a there's a reality where it's so dry outside that this green vegetation will burn, uh, but it's very key that we're planting in a way that we're picking a relative humidity, a day since rain, um, all these other factors that make it so this green fire break is totally not available from a fuel standpoint. And this really works. This works really well. Um, it also works good for um, wildlife. So you know, this could be a travel corridor, this could be an area for turkeys to, to pick bugs, um, broods will use this, whether it's quail broods, um, turkey broods, um, whitetails will use this as a travel corridor, um, maybe some browse or grazing um, action here. And so this is, this has a dual feature, right? So one, it's really good for us to continuously burn off of, and two, it really does have value um, for wildlife, because as again, you're putting a different kind of cover type in between all of this other stuff, right? So this again runs through the forest, it runs through thicker vegetation um, on the right and the left. Um, and so it's really good from a wildlife standpoint, but again, it does take a little bit more effort. Um, this is planted every year, but you can use other things like uh, perennial clover is a really good permanent fire break. Even um, picking out areas on your farm and mowing them constantly um, will encourage cool season grasses to grow and not that we want to encourage cool season grasses from a wildlife standpoint, but cool season grasses are really good green fire break as well. All right, now I just wanted to mention the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council really quickly. So the, the mission of the Kentucky Prescribed Fire Council is to promote uh, the understanding and enhance collaboration for the use of ecologically based prescribed fire in the Commonwealth. And this is really what I wanted to get to. So we offer or the council offers two trainings and certifications. One is a certified burn boss. Um, and this one takes experience and quite a few prerequisites. Um, these are individuals that are going to be planning and doing fire at like a kind of a higher level. Um, and that, it, if you have the certification, you're actually allowed to burn within those two burn band seasons that I mentioned before. Um, the second one is the eight hour course, which you all might be interested in. So this is a real basic introduction to prescribed fire and control burning. Um, this serves, you can serve as crew member on burns with eligible agencies. Um, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources is one of those eligible agencies. So if you got this um, certificate training, um, then you could come with us and, and burn with us and, and see how it's all done. Um, and, and the best thing for prescribed fire is just uh, gaining real world experiences of actually doing it. Um, and that'll make you a lot more comfortable with it. And I totally encourage anyone that's even thinking about this to, to get a hold of me, which my contact information is here, um, or Jacob Stewart. He's our fire management officer for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. And with that, I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you for that. Thank we you. really appreciate it. And, you know, I was, I was curious as if um, somebody wanted to actually burn their woodlands. Um, yeah. Who would they call? How do they get started? I mean, they shouldn't just go out and do what you said and then start putting fire down, correct? Yeah, Renee, that's such a great question. Thank you so much for asking it. And so um, in that eight hour course, actually, so I, I had 20 minutes. I'm so fortunate. I I'm that. appreciative of those 20 minutes. That, <laughs> that eight hour course is actually, we need eight hours to talk about that stuff like you just mentioned. And so just really quickly, um, you have to contact the Kentucky Division of Forestry, mm -hmm. our Kentucky Department of Forestry before you burn and your local dispatch. And so essentially what that's going to do, one, KDF is the responding agency for wildfire. So they'll know, okay, this person is going to do a controlled burn. This is not a wildfire situation. They won't send resources. I mean, they got fixed wing airplanes. They have response crews. They won't send those things out to a prescribed fire. Um, and then dispatch. So the county dispatch, those are the individuals that'll get the, if somebody's driving down the road, like you all mentioned earlier, and they call 911, they say, oh my gosh, there's a, there's a forest fire down here. Yeah. Dispatch will catch all those calls before they get to the volunteer fire department in the rural county or something that you're operating in and will tell them, hey, there's no need to worry. This was called in. You know, that's a great question. So the two is KDF and uh, your local dispatch. Gotcha. All right. That's it. 
Cody, I was going to say, um, we had Jacob on a while back and he gave us a presentation about some of these controlled burn workshops you all had been putting on. And one of our viewers had actually attended one of yours and I had a chance to speak with them and rave reviews for you all. And they're really, um, they were really impressed with the quality of program and the expertise. So, um, you know, I'll encourage you as you all have more of these opportunities available, you know, use this as an outlet to help get the word out um, about some of the great work that you all are doing over at the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Yeah, thanks so much, Billy. I appreciate that. And we, we got five more coming down the pike, hopefully, um, in this summer, this the summer of 23. And those will be scattered all over the state. And so we will definitely make sure to, to share those with you all. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah we we'll always advise them. them. So, yeah, just let us know. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful. As always, Cody, appreciate you, buddy. Look forward to having you back again in the future. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Okay, take care, sir. Right. Cool stuff, Renee. Well, hot, cool, but cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was a hot topic, but in a cool way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cody's so great. You know, and I'll remind folks, you know, not only are they helpful there, but they also have private lands biologists and farm bill biologists that are available to work with you all on your property. So if you're a woodland owner and you've got some property and you're interested in wildlife, it's an organization that has some support for you, not only technical, but they can help connect you to some financial support, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, moving on now, we um, we are going to talk with Grace Coy. She's back on our show and you can turn your camera on if you'd like. Um, and she's going to be letting us know a little bit about some tree ordinances that, you know, it, it may not be specific for your community that she's talking about because uh, we have, you know, all everyone in Kentucky. However, um, she's going to let us know a little bit about, you know, where you can look, how you can find out, you know, and um, she'll give us all those details. Thank you, Renee. It's great to be back on From the Woods today. Um, yeah, so um, talking about tree ordinances today, I will have a piece in the presentation too where I can talk about if you're not quite at the point where you want to establish or are ready to establish a tree ordinance, there's also some additional things that you can do either in lieu of or in advance. So I hope there's something for everybody here today. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so as I was introduced, um, I'm Grace Coy. I am the coordinator for the Urban Forest Initiative. We are a group based out of the University of Kentucky, um, and I also am an Agricultural Extension Associate with UK Forestry and Natural Resources, which means that I get to work with Renee and Billy regularly, which is awesome. Um, today I'm going to be giving you an overview of tree ordinance types and talking about some of the ways that those can be effective, um, and then also to give some options for how to engage engage your community in the tree canopy without necessarily having to have regulations. So before I get too deep into anything, I want to make sure I go over the definition for an ordinance. Um, so an ordinance, just generally speaking, is a type of law or regulation that's typically enacted by a local government, such as a city or county. Um, so uh, they can be related to um, or they are related to a specific issue or concern and to highlight there, because we'll go back to that in a second. Um, but it can relate to land use, public safety, transportation, or environmental protection. Um, so ordinances are enacted by local legislative bodies. So this could be a city council or board. Um, and once they're enacted, they do carry the force of law. So they are established and their standards that are um, required to be met unless of course there are waivers or things like that, but they do have um, enforcement power and if there are violations to an ordinance that can result in fines or penalties. So it has a little bit more heft than maybe like a policy or kind of a master plan sort of things. Regulations actually have um, direct lawful application. Um, so in the case of what we're talking about today, the specific issue or concern in the context of tree ordinances of, are of course the tree uh, protection of trees in a community um, and the enhancement of the tree canopy. So when I'm talking about tree ordinances, that's what I mean. So going into the different types of tree ordinances. So before I get into these different categories, I want to lead with um, the fact that most effective tree ordinances are a combination of these types. Um, but I thought it would be important to break them down based on their main function and how they might uniquely serve in forwarding tree canopy goals in a community. 
So the first one is a tree preservation ordinance. So these ordinances typically focus on protecting trees. Oftentimes they're trees that are considered significant significant or valuable um, for different reasons. Often that's due to age, maybe they're a specific species or size, and sometimes even of cultural or historical importance, you can have regulatory protections on those trees. Um, and this ordinance type, you might have a requirement to get a permit for removal of certain trees that meet these characteristics, um, and violations could result in fines or penalty, but it's just a way to um, enforce preservation, especially of some signature trees on the landscape. Next up is tree replacement ordinances. So these types of ordinances require property owners or developers to replace trees that are removed or lost due to development or other types of development activities. Um, they may specify the type or size of replacement of trees. So there might be a list that um, you would pull from. Uh, maybe it's focused on um, certain types of canopy trees or native trees. Um, and they can also specify a time frame for planting so that people are held accountable to um, replacing them in a timely manner Manner so that canopy isn't missing from that location for too long and a new tree can get established. Next is our tree planting ordinances. So this is a little, little similar to replacement, but it's a bit more proactive. Um, and they're ordinances that require property owners or development professionals to plant a certain number of trees on their property or in designated areas. So that might be for new development and having to have a certain number of trees anytime a new structure is put up, um, or it could be in a case of uh, canopy loss and ensuring that a certain number of trees is present at all times. Um, again, similar to tree replacement, there might be some specification on the types of trees that you can plant um, and making sure that they're suitable for the area and for the land use that, um, that the project is unfolding over. Next are your tree maintenance ordinances. So these ordinances require um, stakeholders to maintain trees or property owners to maintain trees on their property in a healthy and safe condition. So this is a lot to do with hazard mitigation, but also to enhance the life and vitality of the tree itself. Um, so the, the tree maintenance ordinances can often too be shared with a municipal entity um, where they might uphold a certain uh, portion of maintenance. It varies depending on the needs of the community, um, but it really has to do with existing trees and managing them in a way that keeps them healthy and safe um, and keeps the community safe as well. Next are our tree removal ordinances. So these ordinances regulate removal of trees of on public or private property. Um, there are sometimes permits involved with this. Um, sometimes it may be tied to, as we mentioned with the tree preservation ordinance, significant trees and needing to get a permit for tree removal there. Um, but some communities have um, permits required for the removal of street trees. So trees between the sidewalk and the street um, or even trees on private property, depending. Um, they also might establish criteria for when uh, tree removal is necessary. And um, oftentimes that has to deal with, you know, is the tree um, posing a hazard? Um, does it need to be removed? Like what are the qualifications to um, be able to enforce a permit for tree removal? Next is our tree canopy ordinances. So um, these are sometimes more bigger picture. Um, they aim to increase and protect the overall tree canopy coverage. Um, so tree canopy ordinances could be over a larger area um, and or they might be tied to certain land use types and they can um, they can require that a certain percentage of tree canopy be established on certain land use types um, that's particularly relevant for new development in different areas. Um, and because these are more overarching, they can often incorporate some general incentives for planting new trees and ensuring that those minimum percentages are achieved. Um, another thing that's important to note just about all of these, whether used in combination or separately, it's gonna vary greatly depending on the community that you're in and the specific needs of the area. Um, Usually a combination of them work um, together and kind of fit the unique puzzle piece. And sometimes none of them work. And it might be, you know, some other option that you would consider if you're wanting to protect and enhance trees, but regulation isn't quite the best route. 
So briefly, I want to talk about what makes a successful tree ordinance, um, and that's of um, any one of those six or a combination thereof. Um, and this is really true for any ordinance or any sort of thing that you're trying to um, push forward in a regulatory way or that you might need to enforce. Um, so first and foremost, clear and concise language. Um, since this is regulatory language, it's really important that the public be able to easily understand, especially if property owners are going to be the ones that are um, uh, having to submit paperwork or apply for permits or really just understand what an ordinance is asking of them. Um, so the more clear you can be on requirements and procedures, the more um, feasibility that um, the people you're working with will be able to um, go through that process and, and ultimately meet the standards that are that are the objective. Um, next up is comprehensive coverage. So I've mentioned this a few times, but um, doing a combination of um, ordinance types can get you um, into a place where you're covering all aspects of tree protection from planting and maintenance to removal and replacement. Um, it also is good to address to different types of trees. So there might be ordinances that deal with trees on private property. There may be ordinances that deal with street trees. So the sidewalk and between the sidewalk and the street. Um, and you might also have some that deal with trees on pub public property. Uh, next is collaborative development. And this is a big one. Um, so anytime you are, um, Dealing in regulation, and particularly when private property in, is involved, it's really important to engage stakeholders um, from the city official level all the way to property owners and people that are independently kind of trying to, um, you know, exercise their property rights and figure out um, that decision making process. So. Um, bringing people along with you and formulating a tree ordinance that reflects the collaboration and the um, kind of balancing of often, you know, different interests um, while simultaneously ensuring that it is protecting trees in your area. So it's, it is a balancing act, but transparency and collaboration will go a long way in the establishment of, of what ultimately would be your ordinance. Um, next, adequate funding and resources. So you could have the best tree ordinance uh, possible on paper, but if you don't have the resources to implement and enforce it, it really doesn't achieve what you ultimately would want it to achieve. Um, so there are many different functions and forms that that uh, funding and, and uh, staff structure could take, but that's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you get an ordinance together, you want to make sure that it can be um, implemented and enforced. Um, so the next one that kind of the same thing, um, strong enforcement mechanisms, you just want that to make sure that's built in so that your goals are being achieved. Um, incentives for compliance, so that might come in and balancing those competing interests to provide incentives for people who might not necessarily be super jazzed about additional regulation, but making it to where they're getting a win a bit as well. Um, and that can come in a plethora of forms. Um, public outreach. That's super important, um, whether the community is actively working with the ordinance or if they just need to know um, about the benefits of trees and why the ordinance is being uh, formulated. Uh, having just a general sort of educational component of the regulations that you're putting out can go a long way in getting buy-in and also just establishing communication with the people in your community. Um, and that could be uh, you know, having meetings, but it also could just be distributing educational materials and just bringing people along with that conversation um, and flexibility. So you want it to be able to accommodate different situation. Um, every um, parcel can be different and there's going to be different challenges. So providing room that um, the ordinance is not a brick wall, but that there are ways to work with people with the unique challenges that might come with their property. So next, I'll just quickly talk about in lieu of establishing a tree ordinance, you might also consider um, some other things. So there are several actions that you can take to improve your tree canopy that um, doesn't have to be regulation right off the gate. Um, regulations can work really well in some areas, especially if you already have land use ordinances or if you have um, planning and zoning. But for communities that are just interested in um, organizing around the enhancement of their tree canopy, there are several things that you can do without needing to get into the regulations. 
Um, so first and foremost, Boots on the Ground is planting more trees. Um, so organizing volunteer planting events, working with local organizations, just to get trees in the ground, whether that be on public spaces or in private property, um, just increasing canopy organically. Um, there can be partnerships with local nurseries, um, different things. So being really um, curious about whether there are groups in your area that are already doing that, or if you could be a champion of planting trees and getting people organized around that. The next one is education. Um, so just generally educating on the benefits of trees, um, the things that they do for us are numerous. And so finding what connects well with your community and kind of running with that. Um, if you ever did take the step to develop regulation, then you know you would already have brought some people along with you and understanding why something like that might work well for your community and why it's important. Uh, encouraging tree preservation just um, generally, you might not be able to enforce it through regulation, but you can educate and communicate with people about how preserving existing trees can be an asset, um, offering incentives that aren't linked to regulation could also be an option. Um, but uh, providing education that encourages tree preservation so that the canopy can be preserved just based on the decisions that people are making from their values versus being forced to from a regulation, which, you know, that's good sometimes too, but um, in lieu of. And then establishing a tree care program, so something that might be through um, extension or just uh, through different means of organizing a, a tree care program. Um, that volunteers could receive training or just be engaged through workshops to learn about proper tree care. Um, that can be kind of your tree maintenance program that the people who engage with that will be that much better able to care for their trees and potentially um, trees in public areas, depending on the way that program might be approached. And the last one, which that could be a topic on its own is formulating a tree board or a tree canopy committee. Um, and so that could be a regular meeting a group of diverse stakeholders that have a passion for trees, that have um, an interest in maybe influencing tree canopy. Um, oftentimes tree boards have the backing of the local government, but it also, you know, they can take sort of informal means of just kind of getting collaborators together to talk about, you know, some of the things in the previous points, like how can we get a tree planting program established and um, just having a system of support not only for the work that you want to do, but that could potentially proliferate out into your community. So thank you all so much. Um, that was uh, kind of the overview there. There are a few things in there that, that could be expanded upon, but that is kind of the general overview of, of tree ordinances. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you all. Great. Well, thank you very much. We uh, greatly appreciate that. And, you know, I was wondering, are there examples of communities that might have active tree ordinances that maybe utilize that as a tree protection tool? Yeah, there are several. And um, the one I can speak most, most uh, in detail about is the one here in Lexington, Kentucky, because that's where I live and I worked in urban planning here. Um, most of the ones that we see in Kentucky are in our more developed areas. Um, and as I mentioned with um, when I was describing the different types, those communities, so I think Lexington, Louisville, Owensboro, Paducah, I'm trying to pull up my notes, not Paducah, <laughs> Lexington, Louisville, Bowling Green, Frankfurt, Covington, and Owensboro all have some type of tree protection ordinance that is tied to their land use regulations. And all of those feature a combination of those different types. Um, I would say one of the key challenges that each of those communities is probably facing is enforcement. And so some of the enforcement pieces mentioned as, as being one of the things you can do to be the most effective um, is, is definitely kind of an ongoing challenge and finding the resources. But I do feel encouraged. I see a lot of resources coming to urban and community forestry um, that may help in, in enforcement or at least uh, establishing community groups that can provide that education um, and supplement uh, the tree ordinances in, in those areas. And then also, you know, the communities that don't have active ordinances might find the time, resources, and enthusiasm to, to pursue regulation if that works for them. Um, but there are alternatives for sure. All right. Wonderful. 
Thank yes. you. So much. Yes. Yay, Grace. Appreciate it. Yeah. What I was going to say, trees are the answer, right? Um, whether they're in urban areas or in a rural areas, they are the answer. So, Grace, appreciate you and the Urban Forest Initiative and the work that you all are doing to try to highlight um, that the importance of our urban trees. Really do appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Good stuff, Renee. Good stuff. So I think you have a presentation for us, just a, a short uh, announcement for us on NRCS. Yes, yeah, we got a quick announcement we wanted to pass along to everyone. Um, John Schultz, our NRCS forester in Lexington, wants to pass along this, this um, update for you. So there is an extension of the application deadline um, because of the Inflation Reduction Act funding opportunity. So now you can get your applications in through for EQIP and CSP by April 21st. So if you're a forest landowner or woodland owner out here in Kentucky and you already have a current up-to-date management plan, then you are in a position to go ahead and apply to get some of those practices done on your property. So um, please reach out to your local NRCS office and inquire about the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, also known as EQIP, or the Conservation Stewardship Program, known as CSP. I will mention that the Inflation Reduction Act funding is specifically targeted to con conservation projects that have an impact on climate and clean energy. And for woodland owners, these would include implementing forest stand improvement, tree planting, and many, many other practices that are approved um, for NRCS funding. So if you are interested in this, we really encourage you to check with your local NRCS office. And again, that deadline has been extended to April 21st. So if you're thinking about it, don't miss this opportunity. And how would they find out where they're in, in NRCS? Um, sure. A, a quick Google search, um, just um, Kentucky NRCS, and you'll be able to quickly find your office, or you can reach out to your local county extension office, and they can probably share the local office. They, we don't have one in every county, so many of these offices serve multiple counties, so you would have to find the one that serves your county, and again, if you can't find it on the internet through Kentucky um, NRCS, then check with your local county extension office, and they should be able to help you identify that location. All right. Well, you know, thank you for sharing that. We greatly appreciate that. And I wanted to share one more thing. Um, the Kentucky Division of Forestry, along with us, uh, are going to be um, uh, celebrating Arbor Day. And so it's going to be at the University of Kentucky Wood Utilization Center, which is in Jackson, um, on April 6th, which is tomorrow. There's going to be a Arbor Day tree planting ceremony at one o'clock, and um, they're going to be giving tree seedlings away. So if you need some tree seedlings, and I've talked to Kentucky Division of Forestry, they will talk to you actually about where you're going to plant it. And, you know, there's different sizes, different ranges, um, where that this should be planted or that tree should be planted. So hopefully you will get some tips as well on where uh, where you should plant that tree. As long as you can come up to them and kind of tell them a little bit about your landscape, they will be able to uh, help you uh, with that. And so again, it's tomorrow, rain or shine, um, at the Wood Utilization Center in Jackson. So we hope everyone can go and participate in Kentucky Arbor Day. Yeah, no doubt. And if you're not close to the Jackson area, then I'm sure there hopefully is some Arbor Day celebration either upcoming real soon in your area as well. So get out, celebrate. Planting trees is always a great thing. Um, so, you know, trees are the answer. And I will I'd like to give a little quick hat tip to Kentucky Division of Forestry because we talked earlier about their role in fire suppression here in the state, wildfire suppression in Kentucky. But they're also our front line for assistance for our woodland owners out there. So if you're a woodland owner, you know, working closely with the service foresters from the Kentucky Division of Forestry is a great way to get your management plan developed, but also get some good conservation practices on your woodland. So please reach out to your local Kentucky Division of Forestry office. And um, they have regional offices that serve all counties, and they have folks that are available to work with you one-on-one -on, -one on your property to help you get the most out of it. Mm -hmm, definitely. So that's all we have for today, but you can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com and see our uh, see any of our clips that we've done. You know, Billy, we were looking at this earlier. We have over 145 hours of content. 
That's a lot. Yeah. So if, if, if there's something that you want to see that's not amongst those 145 hours, exactly. let us know and we'd be happy to try to cover it. We did get a um, another recent request that we're working on. So if you've got anything that you think others um, could benefit from here in Kentucky with deals with woodlands, wildlife or our natural resources, let us know and we'll try to find somebody who can cover that topic for us. Yeah, we always try to fulfill requests from our viewers. So, you know, you're important to us um, and we greatly appreciate you joining us each Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Until then, take care. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Love the woods today.